हे निबाशा घुगुती रूंजो हे निबाशा घुगुती रूंजो मेरी एजु सुड़ा We hope you have been enjoying the Missouri Mountain Festival 2020. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. This is the sixth and final session, and we've saved some of the best for last. If you've been following the program until now, I'm sure you will have appreciated the rich variety of presentations, which reflect the greater diversity of the Himalaya. As we begin the final session of the festival, we'd like to hear a few words from the founding director, Stephen Alter, who happens to live just above Hanifel Center at his family home. Oakville. Thank you all for being a part of the Missouri Mountain Festival 2020. Uh, even though this year we've had to have a virtual festival, it's been a wonderful opportunity to bring people together from all over the world. And I'd like to thank, first of all, all of our presenters who've done such a wonderful job of bringing their ideas, their experiences, their vision of the Himalaya and other mountain ranges to our festival. And I'd also like to thank. Our team here at Hanifel Center, uh, Krishnan Kuti, who's the executive director, Akshay Shah, who's head of programs, and Renu Oberoi, who's the assistant director of the Missouri Mountain Festival. My special thanks to all of them and to the Woodstock community for supporting this venture. Thank you. And now here is the final slate of speakers. session is by the Woodstock choir. They will be singing from the sound of music. These are the, the chords, the first chords of the song "The Sound of Music," released in 1965, and immediately became one of the most successful music scores on the contemporary history of music. And it sold more than 20 million copies in a few years. Today, 50 years later, we have decided to record this song with the Woodstock Faculty Choir, not because of the beauty of, of the words and the melody. but because its lyrics are really inspiring for us because it's a blessing a prayer to the mountains 50 years ago oscar hammerstein wrote its beautiful words the hills are alive with the sound of music with songs they have sung for a thousand years the hills fill my heart with the sound of music my heart wants to sing every song it hears I go to the hills when my heart is lonely. I know I will hear what I heard before. My heart will be blessed with the sound of music, and I'll sing once more. These inspiring words can help us to understand the beauty of the mountains and to reconnect us with the Himalayas, of course. The virtual choir we are presenting today was entirely recorded from home by the faculty of Woodstock from India, from the US, from Spain. We collected their videos, their audios, we put them together. We created this virtual choir uh, in a studio here in India. We had some collaborations with the UK for the mastering and it was specially recorded to be premiered today. at the Musori Mountain Festival. So, uh, I hope you enjoy the video and this is the sound of music.
Up next, we have Siobhan Kidd, Outreach uh, Conservation Educator for the Snow Leopard Conservancy. Hello, I'm Siobhan Kidd, and I'm the author of Searching for the Snow Leopard, Guardian of the High Mountains. The concept of this book came from the Snow Leopard Conservancy's Australian Ambassador, Margaret G. She approached us with the idea of creating a book with seek and find pictures where the reader would attempt to locate a snow leopard hidden against a background of rock and snow. To begin work on the book, I reached out to two wildlife photographers with whom I'd worked on an article for the Conservancy's newsletter describing their recent snow leopard photographic expeditions. Bjorn Pearson from Sweden and Oriol Alamini from Spain. They agreed to share both their writings and their beautiful photographs. I expanded our team to include citizen scientist and wildlife photographer Tashi Gali from Nepal, artist and writer Susan Leibach from Canada, photographer Jack Wonderly from California, and independent snow leopard researcher Katie Duffy from Ohio. All the contributors had recent photographs from the field and were willing to contribute essays describing their experiences. A snow leopard trek doesn't always end in a sighting of a snow leopard. Sometimes all that is seen is a scrape or a spray marking or perhaps a footprint or two. And though you may not have the privilege of seeing a snow leopard, you may hear them. For those who go in search of the snow leopard, the expedition may hold unexpected discoveries. Though their goal is to observe and photograph one of the most elusive predators on the planet, they may also witness a magical transformation of the stark, frigid landscape to one of true beauty and experience the interconnectedness of nature and the human spirit. 
Katie Duffy describes what the experience of a snow leopard trek is like. Hiking in the footsteps of this elusive cat through remote rugged terrain in unforgiving conditions, you get more of an appreciation of the persistence of the species. You become more in tune with what it takes to survive in one of the planet's harshest environments. It's a place that seems untouched by time, where nature reminds you just how mortal you are. The mountains expose your true self. There's no place for ego here and no place for hastiness. Everything happens in its own time. If the mountains wish to reveal their most sacred guardian to you, they will. Until then, all you can do is just be. Snow leopard tracks are difficult. There's the cold, the high altitude, and the difficult terrain. A snow leopard trek is also a test of the human character, one that calls for courage, patience, determination, and perhaps most significantly, humility. Obtaining images of a wild snow leopard is less about skill and having the latest equipment and more about respect for the mountains and for the cat and its ability to not only survive, but thrive in a harsh and challenging environment. One of the chapters toward the end of the book explores the legends and folklore surrounding the snow leopard and discusses the spiritual connection people have with this mysterious and awe-inspiring cat. The stories found in this chapter carry the powerful message that although the snow leopard is of great ecological importance, what resonates with the local community members is its cultural and spiritual significance. Snow leopard conservationists work with community-based organizations within snow leopard range countries to incorporate these indigenous beliefs into a relevant conservation message. The Snow Leopard Conservancy's mission, which is one of advancing community-based stewardship of the snow leopard through education, research, and grassroots conservation action, is described in the final chapter of the book. If you would like to obtain a copy of Searching for the Snow Leopard, I invite you to visit the Snow Leopard Conservancy's website at www.snowleopardconservancy.org to obtain your copy. Proceeds from the sales of the book support the Snow Leopard Conservancy and its programs. Thank you so much for listening and have a wonderful day. Up next is Sanjay Nepal, who will speak on the Kumari Devi practice in Nepal. Hello, everybody and welcome to Missouri Mountain Festival. I'm Sanjay Nepal, and I'm from Kathmandu. When we talk about the mountains, we often talk about the Himalayas that are the highest and the youngest mountain chains in the world. The mountains are not just mysterious, magical, but it also holds in its lap a lot of unique stories. And one such story comes right from the old part of Kathmandu Valley. It is the story of Kumari, the living goddess. She is a young girl who comes from the family of the Buddha and is chosen to become the living representation of Parvati, the spouse of Shiva, the Hindu god. Then her horoscope is very well studied by the royal astrologer because the horoscope has to match not clash with that of the ruler of the country she also needs to possess 32 physical qualities that as prescribed in a 17th century book she needs to be physically perfect she needs to have like black hair black eyes long slender fingers golden voice no cuts no bruises no birthmark on the skin and then comes the mental test where she needs to spend a night in the temple dedicated to Parvati overnight. And if she can keep her calm, next day we declare her Kumari, the virgin goddess. And she remains there in a special house called the Kumari house till puberty. At puberty, she is replaced by another girl. But during her stay, Hindus and Buddhists from all over the world come to take her blessing, as people believe that she is capable of curing them of their misfortunes, diseases, illnesses, and any kind of harm. 
During these last 300 years, since the Kumari tradition started, a lot of things have changed. Modernization has crept up into the tradition. From 12 noon to 4 in the afternoon, Kumari goes through private tutoring so that she doesn't miss out on her schooling days. She has a pet dog, she has a satellite television, she can also play with her siblings, and she's not lost inside her golden home. She keeps in touch with the reality of life. In September, the ruler of the country will come and seek her blessing and bow down his or her head in front of her, seeking the vermilion powder on his forehead. This marks that till next festival, everything will be all right in the country. She holds a very powerful and very important role in our society. And this also reflects how Nepal looks at women or girls. She is regarded as a symbol of Shakti, a Sanskrit word for energy. And if you ever get a chance to come to Kathmandu, I will recommend that you go and visit her in Kumari House in old Kathmandu city next to Kathmandu Palace Square, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And who knows, maybe she will look down on you and bless you. Okay? Thank you for listening to my story. Up next, we have Professor Andrew Alter, an Associate Professor in Music Studies at Macquarie University in Sydney. This is Andrew Alter, and I'm happy to participate in this year's virtual edition of the Mount Missouri Mountain Festival to talk about drums and drumming in the Himalayas. I'm going to begin my talk here on Mount Kailash, just across the border between India and Tibet. It's a highly appropriate place to begin because any discussion of drums and drumming in the Himalayas is going to at some point mention Shiv and his overarching influence on drummers. Shiv is often shown this way, playing his damru accompanied by his wife Parvati. The drum symbolizes the primordial sound through which Shiv is believed to have created the universe. For this, this reason, most drummers in the Himalayas will acknowledge the prominence of Shiv as the guiding deity for their sounds, their actions, and their knowledge. But what are these drums, and is there any similarity between them? In reality, this damru shown in Shiv's hand here probably has little to do with the reality of drums. It's more a symbol representing the primordial sound that Shiv makes while creating the universe. Amongst the books on my shelf is this one by Shivanand Nortyal called Garwal Ke Lok Nitya Geet, that is, the folk dance songs of Garwal. In it he makes a number of comments on music, songs, drums, things like that, and one of his comments on drums is telling. He notes how Shiv is always shown with the damru. But he says, how could Shiv be shown with such a menial instrument? This instrument is used to, with, by monkey dancers to make monkeys dance. Shiv's drum must be different. It must be a bigger drum, something like a dol or a don. Another book I have in my collection is this outstanding study of thousands of drums used by shamans across the Himalayas and North Asia. Written by Michael Opitz in 2013 in two volumes, and over a thousand pages, including photographs, this is the most comprehensive study of drums in the region to date. On the right-hand side of this slide, you can see two types of drums performed in different rituals. The upper one by a shaman from central Nepal and the lower pictures of Nakshi people from the eastern Tibet. The lower picture is one of the few in Opitz's book that shows a pellet drum. And in this sense, it's a little like the drum of Shiv. In reality, even these drums are not at all like Shiv's damru. Many of the drums played by shamans in Nepal are like this one. Here, a bombo shaman from amongst the Tamang people of Nepal plays a larger version of the pellet drum. But in this case, he uses a stick rather than rattling it back and forth with pellets like a damru. Notice in this image of a Tibetan ritual in Bhutan, 
how the drums are larger versions of the bombo's drum in Nepal. So there's clearly a style of drum used in various ritual occasions that look a little like Shiv's drum, but not really close to it. This drum, found in Garhwal and called a Dor, is also used by shamans, and it looks a little more like Shiv's Damru, though again, no pellets are used to play it. Now finally, a drum that looks more like Shiv's. Here the Hurki, played by a shamanic ritual specialists, looks a lot more like a Damru, but again, no pellets. Instead, it's played with the fingers while the specialist sings, and it sounds a little like this. But of course there are other drums, like these single-faced kettle drums, the Nagara from Garhwal, or the Daman also from Garhwal. They look a lot like this, the Damaha pair from central Nepal, again associated with the Bhairavi temple. Or this Tiamko played by Gorkhas. Even here in Ladakh, two kettle drums played by somebody in the musician caste from that area. All these are single-faced drums and usually used for accompaniment to other instruments. Normally they're all played by two sticks and they have a history that goes back to military processions and marching bands of the medieval Mughal period. But by far the most dominant drums of the region are the dhol, the double-faced instruments like this. On the left, Purandas plays the dhol from Buddha Kedar and Garhwal. Or on the right, these dholes, played by the Pung Cholam group that came to the Masuri Mountain Festival two years ago. Or this massive procession of dholes amongst the Newar of Bhaktapur near Kathmandu. Which of these drums did Shiv really play while meditating here on Mount Kailash? In reality, it is all of them. The Damru is simply a symbol of the many sounds that come from all the drums. They all tap, tap into the imagined sound of Shiv's drum. They derive their power from the creative force of Shiv's original sounding of the drum. Here in the Himalayas, the sounds of these drums are heard as the creative forces of the universe. The next presentation is by Jigmes Angmo, Woodstock Class of 2021.
next we have Lalita Krishnan producer and host of the podcast Heart of Conservation Some time ago a put bowl of water out for the birds when the clever langurs arrived to drink they decided they might as well raid my garden They seem to know there's nothing safer than an animal lover's spot to hang out in and soak in the sun. They also discovered my kitchen wall is a perfect salt lake. Hi, I'm Lalita Krishnan and I live in Landore. Now the Landore Langos trust me enough to let me photograph them. I hope you enjoy watching them as much as I have. for something completely different orchestra naive I'm, I'm calling about the Hanafal center you know how how high is that masuri masuri you know in india ah oh hello oh that's you <laughs> what would we take orchestra naive to the masuri mountain festival the masuri mountain festival orchestra naive is on its way with out of the olives
Up next, we have Maninder Kohli, director of the IMF Mountain Film Festival. In recent years, adventure film festivals have been gaining in popularity. Several international film festivals, including BAMF, are featured in India, but sadly, content from the Indian Himalaya is virtually absent. Several of us at the Indian Mountaining Foundation felt it's time to establish an India-centric homegrown festival. That's how the IMF Mountain Film Festival got established four years back. The unique aspect of the festival is that only films shot in, the, shot in India are screened. Since the inception of the festival, it's interesting to note the reaction of the key stakeholders. Filmmakers now feel that they have a platform where their work gets recognized. Several athletes get featured in the films, which gets them fair amount of visibility. And above all, we are able to showcase the enormous adventure potential in India. Previous editions of the festival have shown films, which include kayaking, mountain biking, ice climbing, snowboarding, trekking, mountaineering, bouldering, and rock climbing. Also in the mix are films on climate change and mountain culture. The IMF Mountain Film Festival takes place every February at the IMF campus at New Delhi. 40 films get screened in various categories. Filmmakers are on hand to introduce their films and take questions. Close to 10 films get awards as the best films of the festival. After the festival is over, an India tour is announced, which runs for about 10 months and close to 50 screenings take place across India. It's estimated about 20,000 adventure lovers view the films every year. I would now like to share details with you of five films which have been popular at the IMF festival since its inception. First up is Roads Unseen. This film was produced by a young filmmaker based in Goa, Amrit Vatsa. The film features a mountain biking trip from Leh to Manali, but with a difference. This short film shares the efforts of an organization called Adventure Beyond Barriers. Do watch this amazing film, which runs for four minutes and was awarded at the first IMF Film Festival in 2017. Second up is another mountain biking film set in Manali, Bavli Booch. Bavli Booch is just four minutes long as well and has been featured in Banff recently. Do look out for the music which sets it apart. It was produced by Foreplay, one of the prominent organizations in India making adventure films. Bavli Booch was awarded in the first Mountain Film Festival in 2017. The third film is Juju Rana's Kingdom. It's made by Munmun Daleria, age 23, a young filmmaker based in Mumbai who specializes in wildlife films. Munmun spent considerable time at the Great Himalayan National Park near Kulu in Himachal Pradesh to document this very shy Western Trangopan. At this year's IMF Mountain Film Festival, Munmun's film was awarded in the wildlife category. The fourth film is titled Bandakni Women Weavers and was made in collaboration with Mukti Datta, who established Panchachuli Weavers around Binsar several years back. On several treks which I have done in Kumau over the years, I would make it a point to, to shop at Panchachuli Weavers before heading back home. This is a touching film on how the woman Mukti works with came out in support of victims of the Kedarna disaster. The film was awarded at the second IMF Mountain Film Festival in 2018. The final film in the mix is the Ladakh project featuring Normia Newman. This film is a high action drama featuring Normia from France who happens to be one of the leading kayakers in the world. In this film, Noria sets out on a seven-day solo journey covering 370 kilometers over most demanding conditions across multiple rivers in Ladakh. 
this film was awarded at the 2020 IMF Mountain Film Festival. All the film featured are available online and I would encourage you to watch them. 70% of the Himalaya are in India and what the films demonstrate is the enormous potential for adventure sports across India. I would encourage you to follow the IMF Mountain Film Festival. Thank you for your attention. Up next, we have Brigadier Ashok Abbey, who is the president of the Indian Mountaineering Foundation. Hello, everybody. I am Brigadier Ashok Abbey. I'm going to be speaking to you about the Indian Mountaineering Foundation. Essentially, I will be covering its heritage and the work done by this body. But before that, I would like to thank the organizers of the Missouri Mountain Festival for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. The Indian Mountaineering Foundation was born in the year 1957. It took its shape in the form of the sponsoring committee for Mount Choyu expedition. Incidentally, Mount Choyu was the first 8,000 meter mountain to be climbed by a then young India. Subsequently, the name of the sponsoring committee was changed to sponsoring committee for the first Indian Everest expedition, which was conducted in the year 1960. Thereafter, this committee was again redesignated as the sponsoring committee for mountaineering expeditions. And finally, on 15th January 1961, the Indian Mountaineering Foundation in its present form came into being. So what does the IMF do and what are its core objectives? The Indian Mountaineering Foundation is the national apex body for mountaineering and allied sports in India. The core activity of the foundation is mountaineering. Essentially, the objectives are to support, nurture and promote mountaineering into an activity of excellence in our country. So what does the IMF do to achieve this? The IMF provides a base for all mountaineers and climbers who wish to climb in the Indian Himalaya. Whether you are a beginner or you are an intermediate climber or you are an experienced mountaineer or an alpinist, the Indian Mountaineering Foundation is there to help you and assist you in every possible way. It will guide you, it will help you equip yourself and it will help you undertake all the necessary clearance and other measures that you require before you climb any mountain. As of now, the Indian Mountaineering Foundation is gravitating towards encouraging young Indians to climb in small teams in alpine style, essentially on mountains which are less frequented or preferably which are unclimbed. The Indian Mountaineering Foundation also as part of its objectives, promotes mountaineering in the mountaineering clubs in a big way. We encourage all mountaineering institutions to encourage their members to climb. The foundation also promotes foreign expeditions to climb in India and welcomes all foreign climbers who wish to climb in India, which undoubtedly is one of the best climbing destinations in the world. We are here to facilitate you, to simplify your entry procedures and to assist you in every possible way so that your experience in India becomes the best in the world. The IMF is committed to it. The IMF also conducts search and rescue operations as and when required. The idea being to reach out to an expedition which is in distress and to evacuate its members in conjunction with other agencies of the state. The IMF also promotes sport climbing and ice climbing with a view to complement its mountaineering skills. The IMF also looks after the environment and conducts regular environmental cleaning expeditions so that the Himalayan environment remains clean. And of course, the mountaineering communities who live in these mountains are also looked after by the IMF in a way that they make your climbing experience, worthwhile and very sustainable. In the end, I will only say that if you have 
a mountain dream or you wish to climb a mountain, come to the IMF and we will help you realize it. Thank you. Next, we have Sujeev Shakya, author of Unleashing the Vajra, Nepal's journey between India and China. Hello, this is Sujeev Shakya and I'm going to talk about my book, Unleashing the Vajra. I'm very happy to be part of the Missouri Literary Festival. Thank you. Unleashing the Vajra was launched in January 2020 at the Jaipur Literary Festival. This book tries to talk about Nepal's journey between India and China. In 2009, I wrote my first book, Unleashing Nepal, Past, Present and Future of the Nepal Economy, where I talked about the necessity of investments, of better management to unleash Nepal's potential. In this book, I go further to talk about societal transformation and how societal transformation is essential for economic transformation. I try to chart out the journey of Nepal in between India and China as a country that is landlinked to the world's largest economies and not traditionally describing it as a landlocked country. I talk about Nepal's potential as India and China are going to be the dominant economic power in 2040 as it was in the 17th century. And as Nepal prospered in the 17th century, I talk about how Nepal will prosper being landlinked to these two countries. I begin the book uh, very early on uh, from 879 CE talking about Nepal with its linkages with Tibet and thereafter the journey of Arniko in building the capital city of Beijing and then the history of the Shah dynasty, the Rana rule and the complicated multi-party democracy and in that how did the society move, how did Nepalese moved and how did Nepalese settle around the world. I talk about the world of global Nepalese. I talk about the young population of a country that is not small, 30 million people, 50th largest populated country in the world, with 50% of its population under 25 and 70% of the population under 35 and the potential of the demographic dividends. But I also caution that if we are not going to transform as a society, it is going to be very difficult to transform as an economy. I talk about the potential. I talk about the undestructible power of the Vajra, the thunderbolt, and the potential it presents to unleash. That's the journey of unleashing the Vajra. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor D.R. Parohit, who is a scholar and a practitioner of folk theatre from Garhwal. Garhwal Himalaya <clears throat> has so many variants of Mahabharata and these almost 16 variants are the ritual variants and the rituals are performed on a particular sung text and the texts vary from three hours to hundred hours. The, long, the longest text of Mahabharata is sung in Kedarnath Valley. It was sung in Agastamuni, in Silla, in Nala and in Falasi temples once upon a time, but it has stopped being performed somewhere near 1975 because of the public nuisance. And then in 1996, with the help of HNB Garhwal University, I tried to reconstruct the circumstances. A singer, Kimanand Benjwal, he was 75 years old then, and then Pachiram Bhatt was 68 years old. I anyhow 
requested them to sing the text and the text was sung for 62 days, continuously for 62 days. And it is a very rigid text. The length of the text for every day is prescribed. The length of singing, singing hour keeps increasing until eight hours from day one to day eight. And then suddenly it comes back to one hour. And on the last day, it is sung for 14 hours. And that day is also called, called Patham, end of the text. And because millions of heroes have been described as killed in Mahabharata, therefore th thousands of sacrifices are offered in the shape of fruits, vegetables, and many other things, not any good, it is not animal sacrifice. So that was the text, that is the longest text of Mahabharata in Garhwal. They say Mahabharata is so popular in Garhwal or so prevalent in Garhwal because at the last leg of their life, the Pandavas were trekking Swarga Rohini. And it was an autumn season and looking down on the valley, which was full of harvest and crops and plenty of nature. Arjun had a longing for reliving this life, but that was not possible. Therefore, he collected all the weaponry of Bhim, Yudhishthir, Draupadi and everyone, put them together on his arrow and shot the arrow towards the valleys and said, hereafter, these weapons, these attributes will receive any kind of offering or any kind of ritual which is meant for the Pandavas. Therefore, as a result, every year Pandavas are supposed to revisit these Garhwal valleys and their ritual is performed in the shape of dance. So it is said, it is not any other kind of puja, but the ritual dances which please the Pandavas. So every day, in the afternoon and then after the dinner in the night, the dance cycles are performed, which are called 18 tala or 18 tals, 18 beats. So, Professor Steve Alter and me also witnessed it together in a village called Pali three years back. And probably he also understands what Pandav Lila is. There are other variants. This Pandav Lila is one kind of ritual which is performed in more than 1000 villages of Garhwal every third year or every sixth year or every year. So it is the longest or it is the, I think, most comprehensive ritual on Mahabharata which is performed in this country. In addition to Pandav Lila, we have the ritual performances for Babrubahan, for Arjun's son uh, Barbarik, then for Abhimanyu, and there are many versions which sing the Krishna Leelas. There is a version for Draupadi, there is a version or called variant for Kunti. In total, there are 16 Mahabharata ritual variants in Garhwal. And it is very interesting that beyond the boundaries of Garhwal, neither in Kumaon nor Himachal, in Himachal Pradesh, any kind of ritual is performed for Pandava. There are songs, there are, there are, there are other, there are temples of Hidimba in Himachal Pradesh, but no such dances or no such performances are held there. work as a uh, rescue person in Missouri uh, and I also work as a, as a trekking guide. I have a small company called Scrambling Adventures. Uh, that's to run my home and, and other things but I, on, on the other side I also do uh, rescue work. Uh, whenever there's any road accident in Missouri, uh, local police has my uh, number, uh, my contact number and they call me and I join them uh, for doing rescues.
मैं कॉन्स्टेबल भगवती प्रसाद पाठक कोतवाली मसूरी जनपद देहरादून से मैं वर्तमान समय में कोतवाली मसूरी में नियुक्त हूँ मसूरी क्षेत्र में जो भी वाहन दुर्घटना होती है या कोई गाय गिर जाती है या कोई बैल गिर जाता है उस संबंध में हम जब भी ज़रूरतमंद हमें इनकी ज़रूरत पड़ती है कीटों की तो ये अपने अपने और अपने साथी के द्वारा मौके पहुंचते हैं सो इन द माउंटेन्स वेन एवर देर देर इज एनी इंसिडेंट द बिगर प्रॉब्लम दैट वी फेस इज इज गियर सो इफ यू डोंट हैव प्रॉपर गियर समटाइम्स वी हैव टू इम्प्रोवाइज थिंग्स सो राइट नाउ आई एम ट्राइंग टू इम्प्रोवाइज अ रोफ लिटर बिकॉज दैट्स द थिंग दैट आई हैड इन माई बैक पैक It's a proud moment for me for being part of the Masuri Mountain Festival. Uh, unfortunately, this year uh, due to Corona, uh, we are doing a virtual mountain festival, and I welcome everyone to come and uh, visit the mountains. Next, we have naturalist and founder of the Tithi Trust, Sanjay Sondi. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be uh, here at the Masuri Mountain Festival. I'll be it online, uh, and not the best of times, but uh, I'm going to be talking about an interesting project uh, where uh, butterflies and moths have been used to incentivize conservation by providing local livelihoods. Uh, the project site in question, where we've been working, uh, our NGO Titli Trust has been working for the last four years, is called Devil Sari. It's about forty-five kilometers from Masuri. The nearest uh, small town, which is Thatiwood, is about thirteen kilometers from this village. The area has got uh, uh, reserved forests, which come under the DFO Masuri. And uh, way back, uh, about seven or eight years ago, when we had started visiting this site, we found that the area has got great uh, bird and uh, butterfly diversity, and it was reasonably well known for treks to Nagtippa. Uh, we thought that it's an ideal place where we could actually involve the local community to develop uh, nature uh, and uh, trekking linked tourism uh, the site is well known for the koneshwar mahadev temple where uh, which is surrounded by some lovely deodar forests uh, in the higher reaches of uh, devalsari there's great uh, oak and rhododendron forest and uh, marvelous biodiversity lots of birds butterflies Uh, moths and uh, lots other uh, flora and fauna and most important uh, motivated local community i mean there's a bunch of people in this area who are committed to conservation uh some of the funky things that are found there the the red squirrel uh, the fire capped it uh, we recently published a paper uh, on this species in uh, a journal called indian birds and this Uh, bird visits devalsari every year in the same location four years in a row between uh, 16th and 18th march precise dates precise location lots of funky frogs lizards and uh, all of this led us to believe that uh, you know possibly we can use uh, uh, these biodiversity uh, specials to to promote livelihoods in this location there's an ngo which is called uh, the devalsari environment protection and technology development society it was formed in 2014 started by arun god that's their website and their logo uh two primary thing that the society promotes uh, the one is one is beekeeping uh, using traditional methods uh, providing an alternate they teach other communities as to how to uh, use traditional methods for beekeeping and uh, they have uh, something called the deodar ecotourism and research center just next to the devalsari reserved forest which is used for nature linked tourism in this location using butterfly and moths we've held multiple events in fact india's first moth meet was held in devalsari in 2016 uh from 2018 onwards we formalized these meets through something called the tithli utsav and uh, the first tithli utsav was held in 2018 the second in 2019 and as you can see the group the group sizes are growing as the area is becoming more and more popular 
Unfortunately, the one in 2020 could not be held because of COVID. But clearly, this is going to be an annual established event uh, for, the, for the local community. Uh, great uh, butterfly and moth diversity. This is just a snapshot of this is actually uh, large signages that are going to be going up in an alfresco in interpretation center being done by the forest department. Great butterfly diversity, great moth diversity. These are all interestingly all day flying moths. And uh, using butterflies and moths as well as other faunal groups such as uh, birds, in their fourth year of existence, the society generated about 15 lakhs of uh, income, which is pretty, pretty great. And uh, they provide both local as well as direct and indirect uh, employment. And it has clearly raised the profile of Devalsari as a, as a location for uh, tourism and conservation. Lots of different conservation programs that uh, the local society promotes, including tree plantation, nature education programs, and so on and so forth. They try and involve the community as much as possible. And a very recent example of how this is paying dividends is that uh, the local community established a, a butterfly park here, which is called the Sridev Suman Titli Park. And at this location, uh, this year, there was a mass emergence of a, a day flying moth, which you can see there. I mean, hundreds of these moths uh, were, uh, a thousand, maybe, maybe even thousands of these moths were seen in September 2020. First published record for Uttarakhand in more than 100 years and spotted by the local community in an area which is just at the butterfly park. So basically wildlife is coming back because of the conservation efforts the local community has made. For all this work, uh, they've been well recognized. In 2019, Arun won the Nature uh, Sanctuary Nature Foundation Award, Wildlife Service Award, and uh, the Outlook Responsible Tourism. Uh, they were in the top three shortlist. Uh, both very creditable achievements for an organization which is uh, only four years old. And uh, lots of people have uh, walked along with Titli Trust in this journey. I mean, ONGC has funded this project for... Uh, through CSR funding, uh, BTDT has helped us with the heritage component and the forest department has been a regular partner with us in this journey. Uh, this site is a great example where uh, uh, local flora and fauna can be used to incentivize the local community to conserve their natural resources and at the same time earn a decent income and livelihood through it. Thank you very much. Next, we have a performance by Thakur Nabam from Arunachal Pradesh. All right. Hi, guys. Uh, this is Thakur Nabam. I'm a singer-songwriter and guitar player from Arunachal Pradesh, India. I'm going to be presenting a song from my upcoming EP. The EP is going to be called uh, Red and Yellow. Uh, be sure to check it out once it's out. Uh, this song is called Good Night, and I hope you guys will dig it. looking for you oh, why didn't you call me last night I don't know why we chose this way I never knew you'd look away I don't know why it's so hard for you to look this way even once you know I couldn't sleep it off the bed never felt so rough and all you had to do was call and say good night dear love good night I know it's been rough 
Good night. I'll see you in the morning. Let's call it a night. Good night. Good night, love. You know, I've come here before as well You know, I looked for you, you were in your shell I'll knock, I won't break in But I'll keep waiting, waiting Until you call me and say goodnight Dear love, good night. I know it's been rough. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. Let's call it a night. Good night. Good night. Love. Thank you guys. That was a song called Good Night from my upcoming EP Red and Yellow. Hope you guys will check it out once it's out. Um my name is Takar Navam. Uh I'd like to thank Masuri Mountain Festival for having me on this. Um uh, take care and stay safe guys. Our special thanks to all of the speakers as well as the organizers. We would also like to express our gratitude to the sponsors, the Friends of Woodstock School Foundation and the Paul and Suzanne Hannifel Foundation. Wherever you are, near or far, we send our best wishes from Woodstock School and Hannifel Center. May the Himalaya continue to challenge and inspire you. Any basha guguti runjo meri eju sudali runjo any basha guguti. Uh-huh.